Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Managing the Placebo Problem in Chronic Pain Studies. I'm Lisa Henderson, the Editorial Director for Applied Clinical Trials, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Applied Clinical Trials and sponsored by Premier Research. Premier Research is a leading clinical development service provider that helps highly innovative biotech, specialty pharma, and medical device companies transform breakthrough ideas into reality. The company has a wealth of experience in the execution of global, regional, and local clinical development programs with a special focus on addressing unmet needs in areas such as analgesia, uh, dermatology, medical devices, neuroscience, oncology, pediatrics, and rare diseases. Premier Research operates in 84 countries and employs 1,100 professionals including a strong international network of clinical monitors and project managers, regulatory, data management, statistical, scientific, and medical experts. They are focused on smart study design for advanced medicines that allow life-changing treatments. And to learn more, you can visit their website at www.premier-research.com. So we have a couple important announcements before we begin. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, we will be ta um, answering questions after the presentation, but you can put the questions in at any time. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small green icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size, and the slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of the presentation window. So I would now like to introduce today's speakers. We are pleased to be joined today by Michael Kuss and Scott Millard. Mr. Kuss is the Vice President of Strategic Development and focuses on building and reinforcing the company's depth in analgesia. He has been with the company since 2001 and has worked as an executive director, clinical trials management, and senior director, analgesia and rheumatology. Michael's focus at Premier Research includes projects in analgesia and rheumatology area. He is responsible for working with clients to help develop clinical development plans, sorry, provide therapeutic expertise to internal and external clients, write protocols, manage study teams, to conduct clinical trials and participate in the preparation of clinical study reports. Prior to joining Premier Research, Michael worked for Pharmacia, formerly G.D. Searle, in various positions, with the last being Director of Research and Development. He was responsible for clinical development of several COX-2 inhibitors and NSAIDs as part of the arthritis and inflammation team. And prior to G.D. Searle, Mr. Kuss worked as a clinical research associate at Abbott Laboratories and as an infectious disease research technologist and clinical instructor at the Department of Medicine at Wright State University School of Medicine. And Michael graduated from Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio with a B.S. in medical technology. And Scott, Scott Millard has worked in the clinical research industry since 1991. Prior to, um, I'm sorry, Scott joined Premier Research in 1997, and since joining Premier, he has served in a variety of roles with increasing scope and responsibility, inclusive of senior clinical research associate, team lead, senior manager, project manager, senior project manager, project director, senior director, and executive director. Scott served at a director level managing project managers and sponsor programs for more than 13 years specializing in analgesia and rheumatology. Scott is currently Executive Director, Street Strategic Development and Analgesia. He serves as the principal strategist who advises, consults, plans, and directs design and strategy of new business opportunities and provides his expertise in the conduct of clinical trials. He is also responsible for developing strong relationships with existing and potential clients, clinical sites, and key opinion leaders. And prior to joining Premier, Scott monitored for a large CRO and began his clinical research career in the Phase I arena at a large Phase I unit in Austin, first as a recruiter and then as an instructor. 
Scott has a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Texas and was certified as a Certified Clinical Research Associate in 1995 by the ACRP. He is a member of the Association of Rheumatology Health Professionals and the American Pain Society with recurring affiliations with IASP, DIA, and ACRP. So thank you both for joining us today. And Scott, you have the floor. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate it. And good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I, I didn't realize uh, <laughs> calling out my certification uh, in 1995 would date me so, so much, but um, indeed, I've been fortunate to, to be here for uh, the last 20 years working in analgesia with my colleague, Michael Kuss. Um, together, today, we're going to discuss managing a placebo problem in chronic pain studies. Um, I do want to mention also that um, this is being um, released in, in conjunction with a, um, a uh, an ebook that we've we've produced uh, called the Placebo Problem, and in that book there are numerous references and further reading recommendations um, in that document that that I'm going to uh, touch on today, and certainly uh, there's there's more to be learned you know within that document. I'll hit some of the highlights. I'll give an overview of the placebo problem in, in chronic pain studies. Um, talk about where we are in the space and you know why this continues to plague us after so much time. Um, I think it's become certainly a, a much more a popular topic recently as we as we uh, approach ways to to uh, mitigate it. So um, it's not that it that it hasn't always been there, but I think now we're looking at ways to actually be able to to try to get on top of it moving forward. I'll talk about some underlying mechanisms uh, that contribute to it, both, both um, psychological and neurobiological. And Mike will um, discuss a study designs, placebo interactions with drugs, uh, independent factors, and in ultimately minimizing the placebo response. So I'll set the I'll set the stage with where we're at and why it's so important. And hopefully, you know, Mike will be able to provide mitigation strategies and design features and failures as well. Um, around the placebo response mitigation. So a brief history of placebo. Uh, first, it's defined in Webster's Medical Dictionary as a, a usually pharmacologically inert preparation prescribed more for the mental relief of the patient than for its actual effort on a disorder, as well as an inert or innocuous substance used especially in controlled experiments testing the efficacy of another substance, such as a drug. I'm, Assuming that most people uh, understand this, but I just want to sort of set, set the stage. The origination of the term, it's interesting to me. I mean, it, it began, it, it, the word placebo first came into use in the 14th century, you know, as the name of, for a professional mourner uh, at, at funerals. And it was an individual who was paid to stand in for a family member of the deceased and, and sing these chants and songs known as placebos. Over time, placebo singers began to have a derogatory connotation, you know, likely due to their social status. And the, the term placebo also came to be synonymous uh, with, a, with a sycophant, so this, this sort of pleasing person. Um, by 1811, it was defined as an, an epithet given to any medicine adapted more to please than to benefit the patient. So you can see the sort of evolution of, of the term. And then ultimately, in, in 1955, Henry Beecher published the article in, in The Power of Placebo in the Journal of you know, American Medical Association, with, where it looked at 15 placebo-controlled trials and concluded that the average placebo improvement was about 35% overall. This was huge and really established placebo as a legitimate medical phenomenon. Placebo effect, um, it's, it's been recognized for hundreds of years as the ability to improve a patient's symptoms by the mere act of providing treatment. It's thought to, it's in, to ensure treatment, sorry, to ensure treatments are effective, we have randomized placebo-controlled trials. So these are blinded studies that, that utilize inactive pills, inert medical devices, even, you know, sh sham surgeries or procedures where we may you know, inject 
uh, saline in, into a patient's body or, or, or something of that nature that has no real uh, uh, chemical effect, but we still want to level the playing field in terms of being able to measure the efficacy of the active treatment. It includes broad responses to entire therapeutic context, not just the inactive treatment. So it's not just one, but several effects working together to produce this um, symptom improvement uh, from placebo. And this can be impacted by things such as um, an expectation of improvement, uh, you know, rituals of care, desires to please the staff, uh, how the treatment is even administered, even, even the color of, of a pill. You know, I guarantee there's somebody right now trying to figure out what color they, they want their pill to be. But likely it'll end up being something light, light blue or white or something of that nature that's not off-putting to, to a patient. Um, the duration of participation in a study can impact placebo, and we'll talk about that a bit. The size of the trial as well. You know, the, uh, the patient's appropriate assessment interpretation of, of the scales that they're given has, has a huge impact. Uh, just understanding you know, what it means, what a zero to 10 scale, what those numbers represent on the scale to them. And of course, there are psychological, psychosocial, and neurobiological impacts as well, which I, I find completely uh, very interesting, and we'll, we'll get to those here in a bit. So let, we need to be clear about one thing, that is that the placebo does not cure. But, but amazingly, it, it can relieve some physiological functions, such as heart rate, blood pressure, lung function, uh, even gastric motility. Uh, I think the biggest, the biggest problem that we have in analgesia trials and other indications as well um, is that our, our primary efficacy endpoints are are the majority of the time and most of the time based on subjective perceptions of the patient. So it's conditions that are self-reported and subjective um, in their assessments, they're the most impacted by the placebo effect. And these in include you know, not only analgesia, but, but other CNS uh, indications like anxiety, depression, fatigue, and others that, that include psychological distress in some way. It's one of our, our biggest obstacles, really, is that we can't just look at a patient and say, oh, well, you're a 7 on a, on a you know, 0 to 10 scale uh, pain scale. It, it, unlike uh, you know, other indications, you may be able to look at, say, a, the size of a tumor, and, and whether it's shrunk or, or grown, um, and, and show some sort of improvement. Uh, we, you know, when we look at OA, even, um, and, and we have the Kelvin-Lawrence uh, scale where we're looking at, at the joint space narrowing in the knee, it doesn't even always correlate with, with uh, necessarily a, a pain rating. So it's, it's all subjective, mostly mental, and, and this is something that we have to um, learn to control. And there's this phenomenon that as treatments are approved, it's easy for patients to have this tendency to expect that new treatments being researched are, are simply improving upon what is out there already. Um, the reality being that they can be completely different types of medications being studied. We were looking at, for example, uh, we were running four different fibromyalgia programs at the same time, all four with completely different mechanisms of action. And this is while, while there are three medications already approved on the market. Um, all of that, um, and particularly if you include additional arms in, in, your, in your trial, leads the, the patient to think that, well, you know, they wouldn't be studying this if it wasn't better than what, what's, what I'm already taking or what's already out there or things like that. It, they can mislead their uh, interpretation of the effect. Chronic pain patients, they're commonly attracted to the care and attention that they're receiving in a trial as the visits are more frequent in, than their usual schedules. Uh, historically, some feel misunderstood and now have attention that they may have felt was lacking. Um, you know, they're, they're seeing their, their, their usual caregiver on a much more frequent basis. Uh, so it's important to really distance the practice in the caregiver mode to the more objective researcher mode. And what, you know, some of the things that, that we've done is, is it, you know, if this is a regular patient at a site, then we will... Um, frequently try to sort of switch up the coordinators on them. If, if their, their, their nurse that they regularly see 
is is said to treat them will have a, a different nurse that they're not familiar with that that they may be more objective with um, uh, serve as their coordinator. Um, it's important that all research staff from the from the PI to the receptionist they must adopt this objective style and be armed with appropriate response training. Um, and and if if you've ever um, heard uh, Dr. Nat Katz talk about this, he also mentions that you know the earlier in the process of the study, the better. Um, you know, introducing training at the onset of the trial is critical to have all patients evaluated in the same manner. You can look at you know you can look at your data as a, your blinded data as the study's going on, and you can see areas where you might want to course correct if, say, everybody is improving when there's only a 50% chance of receiving medication. There may be some training that, that, that can be used to course correct, but by then, you're real, it's really a little, little too late. You, you want all of the patients who have received the same level and understanding of training with respect to um, the assessments and, and placebo. So you, you want to employ this at the beginning of a trial and as soon as possible, and you don't want to make it too onerous on the on the patients to, to where it takes so long that sites start putting it off, uh, you know, until after other assessments have been done. Um, but site-specific and patient training is important to maintain an objective approach. And now, um, you know, we do have available to a specialized and validated consultant groups that that simply focus only on this. So that we tend to employ that with with all of our trials now. So speaking of, uh, of fibromyalgia, there's something I want to talk about called the, it's the effect size. And when we talk about effect size, we're talking about the amount of improvement that the, the patients show that are on active treatment versus the, the improvement that patients show that are on placebo. And about a decade ago, there were, there were three drugs essentially racing the market to treat fibromyalgia. It, it, recently become a, a, a better recognized indication. And um, there was certainly a, a market, and there certainly still is, uh, for patients to be treated. So there were three drugs that eventually made it to market at different times. The, um, one, of them, one of them that I want to look at, well, all three, but the first one I want to look at is deloxetine in the 60 to 120 milligrams per day. That drug, had up to 49% of the patients on deloxetine showed improvement, which is fantastic. Uh, but we also had 32% of them that were on placebo showed improvement as well. So the the overall, you know, the effect size here we're looking at was was 17%. So if you you deduct the placebo from the from the active, so only 17% more patients showed improvement versus placebo. The next one I'll look at is nonacepran, which, which is Civella, and deloxetine, by the way, is Cymbalta, um, for those of you that wouldn't know that. Um, nonacepran, their results were 61% of patients had showed improvement, but up to 36% of the placebo patients also showed improvement. So you can see that there's this, there's this chasing trend here, placebo not far behind, although this 25% um, improvement today would be uh, quite high. Lastly, I'll talk about Pregabalan, which, which is uh, Lyrica, and, and it's, it's become kind of the go-to first-line first, first line treatment just um, for many patients on fibromyalgia. Uh, they had a 43% improvement on Pregabalan and, and up to 29% on placebo. So there was only really a 14% a difference in, in active patients versus placebo. Um, and all they had to do at the time was to show a 30% reduction or 30% improvement, I should say, you know, in, in pain severity. So they met that mark, but when you look at the placebo responders, um, it's an interesting uh, correlation there. This is a rising problem. Of, and I, I could just sum up, you know, all of, of this presentation really I would I would put it in the, in just in this first bullet point, which is that large clinical programs that have shown prior clinical efficacy have failed due to the inability to separate from a high placebo response. It is uh, it's deemed the highest contributor to outcomes in neuropathic pain, 
in the last decade, nine out of out of ten uh, trials have uh, failed in, in neuropathic and cancer pain. Um, and this isn't the only reason, obviously. Um, you know, there are plenty of medications that just don't work um, and and make it very difficult to, to separate from placebo. But certainly, this contributes and is the highest contributor to the reasons why um, these trials have failed. The placebo response in analgesic trials is growing over time. Um, there's no question about this. Uh, and, and it seems to particularly be the case, and it's evident in neuropathic pain trials that are in the United States. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, about the causes of that here in just a bit. Um, there's a meta-analysis of 84 neuropathic pain studies that in 1996 showed a 30% greater pain relief compared to placebo. That has now been reduced to just 9%, and that was by 2013. So in, in a co the course of a couple of decades, we have decreased from 30% to 9% in our ability to separate from placebo. So that, that's a serious problem, and, and that's really um, the, the setup for the second half of what we're going to talk about, which is our ways to, to mitigate it. So what are the causes of, of this? And, and, and there are two primary ones, and one that's just interesting that I wanted to bring up today. There are additional uh, uh, aspects that you can read about in, in, in our ebook. But the first is the, the increase in the sample size. We've gone from the 90s uh, with, with relatively small studies to, to much larger studies now contributing to more treatment arms um, with potential increased expectation of treatment. So if you're in a study and, and there are, you know, two active arms and one placebo arm and you have a, a you know, a two-thirds chance of receiving treatment, you're, you're li likely to expect that, that that'll be the case. And if you receive placebo, you may be anticipating um, active treatment and it may Im impact the way you, you perceive it. Um, not only that, um, you know, more sites are necessary to address the number of, of patients for enrollment. And the more sites that you increase, the, very, the more sites that you have, you increase the variability. Um, and you, you start to lose procedural control and, and really the potential for all confounding issues um, begins to increase. Um, so Mike will talk a little bit more about um, about site, about the number of sites and, and the variability in, in placebo response here in just a bit. Um, one other aspect is increased duration of the trial. So, you know, we've increased the average length of the chronic pain trial from four weeks in, in 1990 to 12 weeks today. Now, there are reasons that that's necessary, but the increased exposure to the state participation and the staff, and I, as I mentioned before, you know, so the number of visits, the the increased attention um, does increase the placebo response. So you have patients coming in now at, at first, you know, maybe every couple of weeks and every month. Um, this is far more more attention and exposure to uh, their healthcare provider than they would typically be receiving, even if they're they have you know only half a chance of receiving active treatment. Just the, the actual attention that they're receiving can impact their perception. Of whether they're in the, and their desi and potential desire to please as well becomes more evident. The one thing I've, I found interesting is, is that uh, the U.S. is uh, just one of only two countries. The U.S. and New Zealand are the, the only two countries that allow direct-to-consumer prescription pharmaceutical advertising. Um, so, you know how that's impacted our our expectations of, of improvement. Um, certainly uh, is something interesting to, that we, we should be looking at. The, the typical American TV viewer, you know, now sees an average of nine ads per day. So um, I don't know. I've never stopped to count it while I was watching TV, but I, I certainly believe, believe this, this. So depending on where you are at, you're at in your development, um, then, you know, your approaches to addressing the placebo a response, you know, may differ depending, you know, if you're, if you've already launched into phase three and, and, and you know, don't have the, the um, you know, the timing isn't right to impact your study design, you know, there may be other, other um, trainings or so forth that you might want to um, impose to, to catch up to 
to where you're at in terms of uh, addressing placebo response. But I think now, um, Lisa, I, I think there's a, a polling question at this point. Yes, there is. Yeah, thank around. you. So, um, audience, your participation, please. So, what development stage best describes your lead asset is the question. And you can choose um, the most appropriate preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three, or post-approval. And just click on the most appropriate and then hit submit. And I'll read it again for you. What development stage best describes your lead asset? Preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three, or post-approval. So um, we'll give you a couple seconds to put in your answers, and then Scott, you can resume um, your presentation. And sure. We'll look at those Thanks, Lisa. In a bit. And I think, and I'll just add, if, if, if you aren't a sponsor or don't have a lead compound, I would probably just ask you to answer, you know, if you're a site, say, you know, what, what, uh, what type of trial are you, are you working on the most or, or you know, takes up, you know, most of your, your time and you, what you're working on? Because the reason I, I bring it up in, is just simply that, you know, it, it helps us um, know at, at what stage we, we need to and what we need to imp implement in terms of uh, addressing the placebo response. So underlying mechanisms contributing to placebo response. Um, the first and certainly sort of most popular assumption is, are the psychological underpin underpinnings. Patient expectancy, um, historically the most accepted psychological theory underlying placebo response. Um, it's this belief of improvement that drives symptom relief. And, um, you know, it may also be, you know, past experiences with study drug influences, expectation, uh, therapeutic environment certainly impacts perception. You know, when you when you see you know a, a doctor in, in, a, in a lab coat and you're you're his, historically you've only ever been in a, in a in an office in a medical office to be treated, uh, the expectation you have at least you know maybe um, subconsciously even is that that you're expecting to see improvement. And this is classical conditioning, which is historical association with a therapeutic environment and an active drug that produces memory. You know that causes the patient to respond to the environment as if as if it was a drug, and um and um you know verbal cues are huge. Um, I've to reference uh, Dr. Katz again. I mean I, he's he I, I've been in presentations where he he's said a number of times that words words are as powerful as drugs, and that that absolutely can be the, the case. These are these are explicit statements that are consciously perceived by the patient. And, and sometimes it's it's not as explicit. Sometimes it's it's the subtle contextual elements, you know, of this therapeutic environment that they're in. You know, like I, I mentioned, you know, lab coats, exam room. These things can elicit expectations as well. Um, it's important again to to separate the research staff versus caregiver personalities. Um, you know, we want them to understand that that it, it's it's a team effort. We're, we're all here to find out whether this this drug works or not. And if they don't uh, objectively interpret it, then it doesn't, it doesn't um, really help the research in the long run, and then they won't improve themselves. So it's, it's a unified theory that's more recently accepted as sort of as a learned phenomenon include, that includes, you know, verbal, conditional, and social observational cues, you know, that, that trigger expectancy. So Lisa, I don't know if we have the re response. Okay, here we go. Yeah. There you go. Okay, so, so it, yeah, it's very interesting. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah. No, go ahead with, with the results. But I, I think all I wanted to, to note was that, you know, phase two and three, this is where the, the, the rubber hits the road, and, and, and this is where it's most important for us to be able to, to uh, mitigate as much as possible our placebo responses. And, and depending, you know, phase two, it there, there are a lot of things that are thrown into a phase two trial to, um, you know, because you can, and, you know, you, know, you want to find out as much as you can about it before you, you pick the direction for your phase three development. And, and doing that, you know, you don't, you don't want to, um, you know, throw so many things in there that it's confusing to the patient. And there's this, there's this sort of assessment, um, you know, uh, fatigue that can, that can happen. You want them to be able to focus 
you know, on, on objectively you know, recording their measures. And certainly phase three, you, by, by then you're, you've likely employed a, a way to, to address this by now. Over the last couple of years, uh, this placebo response mitigation has been, has been uh, a real hot topic. And, and I would expect that by the time you're, you're entering phase three that, that you've employed some method to address this. And if not, um, that's certainly something uh, we should be looking at. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, and this will be my last, my last slide before Mike takes over, but what I think is just the most, the most fascinating aspect of all of this um, really are the, the neurobiological mechanisms. So, you're, you know, you're, your body has its own sort of defense system of, of providing chemical substances to, to alleviate uh, things like pain. And placebo treatment, um, you know, reduces activity in a number of classical pain-related brain regions receiving input from spinal nociceptive pathways. So they, there are over um, 40 you know, PET and functional MRI studies that have been done that show that the activity in the brain when, when placebo is introduced, um, when the patients are, are expecting uh, active treatment, that the placebo actually um, you know, reduces that activity in the brain where the pain is, is noted. And, um, I think that's just fascinating, and, and it's also correlated with the strength of the, of the pain, of the perception of pain relief provided. So, if they think, if a patient thinks that they're receiving a stronger medication, um, they actually the, the placebo effect is, is actually stronger and and reflected in these these functional MRI studies. So, um, it, it's it's sort of you know if if you think that you are being relieved of pain, then you sort of are being relieved of pain in terms of how you're, you, certainly how you're perceiving it and how your body's perceiving it. So it's, it's a very powerful, um, it's a very powerful thing. And, and your body has this endogenous neurotransmitter system where it releases, you know, its own opioids within your, within your body that act specifically uh, uh, on, the, on the mu opioid receptor where uh, your body can release opioids, and this was proven in a, in a 1978. Uh, there was a dental extraction study where the patients received placebo, thinking they were receiving an active treatment, an opioid, and it relieved their pain. And not, but it not only relieved their pain, but um, it, it had it, it relieved their their other other side effects uh, uh, or it caused other side effects such as, you know, their breathing and blood pressure and so forth. What's amazing to me is that it was then reversed with naloxone and, and not only was, you know, the, the pain symptoms reversed, but, but the side effects were also reversed. So, you know, it just shows that there are actual, uh, you know, opioid um, chemicals within your body acting on, on the receptors that that, you know, w without it being presented externally. So, to me, you know, and that's, that underlies both expectancy and condition mechanisms. So, I, I thought that was just very fascinating, and you can read more about that in the ebook. But um, the last thing I'll mention is it's not just the opioid system. There's also the do dopamine neurotransmission um, in, in that response in a similar way in expectancy and, and perceived relief. So with that, I would like to turn the presentation over to uh, Michael Kuss, uh, Vice President um, of Analgesia here at Premier. Hi, Scott. Uh, thanks for that intro, and um, good morning, everyone. I think it's still morning everywhere here in the U.S. Um, what I'm going to talk about is some of the methods that we use to measure the placebo response um, currently. Um, initially in research um, studies and then things that we've looked at over time um, that could be um, used to mitigate the placebo response. So um, this first slide talks about, you know, there are some experimental designs that allow us to measure the, the placebo response and they're such as active versus placebo versus a no treatment arm. So um, that this is a typical parallel group design with the addition of a no treatment arm, and no treatment arm meaning that they're part of the study, but they're just getting standard of care or no active treatment. 
uh, whatsoever. And then um, the placebo response in, the, in these studies is, is the difference between the placebo and the no treatment arm responses. Now, this is great for research studies, but not necessarily great for um, uh, randomized clinical trials in phase three. Uh, we don't want to uh, cloud the water by including a no treatment arm in these studies. Um, and then there's the crossover design, which is um, in this type of study, each patient gets treated with the test drug and then crosses over and gets treated with placebo and vice versa. So it's, a, it's an AB versus BA uh, randomization. Uh, this allows patients to serve as their own control. Uh, however, there's limited um, issue, uh, limiting issues with this design because of the fact that patients uh, are uh, and the subsequent treatments are reacting to the previous treatments that they had. So um, this is a, a sort of conditioning like Scott had talked about before, and it would be considered almost like pharmacological conditioning. Um, and that brings me to the next, um, the next two um, types of uh, study designs. One is uh, response conditioning, which is um, verbal instructions are used to condition subjects. This has been used um, a lot with functional MRI to study the placebo response. And then pharmacological conditioning, and it's a situation where subjects are conditioned with the drug plus a verbal and nonverbal cues. And, and, and Scott talked about this earlier that, you know, uh, Nat has said in the past that words are as powerful as drugs sometimes. So these verbal cues that they receive along with the drug um, uh, can be very powerful, and so we. This is another method of looking, uh, in a research way, uh, at the pharma at the placebo response. So, um, but there's also um, the the drug placebo interaction uh, possibilities, and then um, how drug and placebo interact is complex and it's not an exact science. We still don't understand it completely. One of the ways that we have and we currently interpret um, the interaction is it's, the, it's an additive uh, method, and that is that the, um, the drug response plus placebo response equals the overall response. And so um, in, both, in your, both your active and your treatment arms, uh, the placebo response, uh, I mean, in your active and your placebo arms, the placebo response will be equal, and the only the additional uh, bump that you get in efficacy is related to the drug response only. So, and then there's the um, interactive method, and that's that interactive assumes that there are unequal placebo responses in the treatment and placebo group. So. Uh, it's a little different than the additive in that um, we're assuming that the, the placebo response is equal in both treatment groups in additive, but we're assuming that there may be some interplay between uh, active and placebo groups that will um, cause the, uh, the, uh, uh, an, an unequal uh, response uh, to placebo. And then finally, there's the fixed maximum response, and, and in fixed maximum response, it assumes that there is a fixed maximum response, and when uh, placebo response increases, then the difference between the treated and the placebo group comes at the expense of the uh, placebo group. And I haven't, um, I didn't put it, it graphically on a slide, but what it means is that, you know, if a patient in, in a study, the best that can possibly happen is a 60% improvement then um, there's going to be um, nothing greater than that. So if your placebo response isn't, isn't managed and you don't keep your placebo, then that, the difference between placebo and 60% uh, is going to be your, your active drug response. And that may not be big enough to uh, show a difference between placebo if you have too much of a placebo response. So um, that's a... a a kind of a new concept, but um, as you saw in Scott's 
uh, presentation where they talked about the fibromyalgia studies. The, the maximum uh, uh, percent of patients that had a 30% decrease in their pain was 61%, and that was in the mildasprine group. And, and that's um, probably a very uh, good expectation for any of the treatments with, uh, um, for fibromyalgia. They aren't, there's not, you're not going to see efficacy at a um, much greater level than that with any uh, drugs that are currently available for treating those uh, conditions. So there's also some um, trial independent factors that factor into the placebo response. And um, these are um, regression to the mean um, and natural tendency for patients to get better. And the, the regression, regression to the mean is, is, very, um, is very damaging to a study. The problem is, um, some patients get into the clinical study with a pain score that exceeds their usual mean pain, but over time their pain moves more towards their mean pain level, which is a more of a reduction. It looks like a reduction in their pain score uh, when, in fact, they're just getting back to where they normally would be. Um, it looks like improvement, but it's really not. If the patient is an outlier at baseline on the low side, though, they don't get in included in the study because their their pain score is too low to qualify. So you get all the the um, the negative effects of regression to the mean um, on the high side, but you don't get any of the positive effects of regression to the mean where pa patients who were having a bad day at the beginning and when they got went to get randomized into the trial and weren't included. Uh, where they would have normally, you know, regressed to the mean and gotten, looked like they got a little bit better. Those p patients do not get included in the study, and, and that's, a, that's a huge problem um, in, in some of these, uh, especially chronic pain studies. And then there's the phenomenon of natural tendency for patients to get better. Um, we see this a lot in, in acute pain studies, but there's also... You know, you see it sometimes in chronic pain studies, and the natural tendency of patients to get better is that, you know, as they participate in clinical trials, sometimes they get better just because they're receiving better care for their underlying conditions while they're in the study. Um, dermatology studies, acne studies are a classic example of that. Um, patients have, um, that are participating in the clinical trials are more likely to be um, uh, performing better hygiene on their uh, skin uh, and then treating it with the, the treatments that they're, they've been assigned. In some of those cases, um, the, the treatments, the vehicle is very efficacious because just from the, the regular cleansing that they're doing prior to the application of the medication uh, allows them to get better even though they're um, they're not actually seeing any drug benefit whatsoever. So it appears to be getting better and it appears to be a drug effect, but in fact it's just because they're, they're doing a better job of taking care of themselves. So I think we have another poll question. Is that correct, Lisa? That is correct, Michael, and it's more and I, of a quiz I than just, a polling question. I'm sorry, what? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So, audience, um, aside from the United States, what other country allows direct-to-consumer prescription pharmaceutical advertising? And your choices are Bulgaria, South Korea, New Zealand, India, or Australia. And I think this is fun, so we'll get to see if you were all listening. And the question again, aside from the United States, what other country allows direct-to-consumer prescription pharmaceutical advertising? Bulgaria, South Korea, New Zealand, India, and Australia. Just choose your answer and hit submit. And we'll give you a couple seconds, a couple more seconds to get that in before Michael takes the presentation back, back over, and then we can look at the results later. Michael? Okay. Thank you. There we go. There's the answers to the questions. 
So, and they got it right. They were listening. <laughs> they ahead. were listening. That was the point. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, we, we live in a country where it's very common for that to occur. And, um, and it's, you know, the assumption is that it's not that unusual to see pharmaceutical ads on television. And so I was frankly very surprised that there was only one other country um, and I did learn something as part of this uh, presentation that New Zealand was the uh, is the country only other country that allows direct consumer advertising for pharmaceutical products. So um, thank you for that. Um, I need to go back one slide to this. You got it. Okay. There we go. There we go. All right. So. Um, we talked about, you know, some some investigational research uh, ways to look at the placebo response, but there's um, there's ways that we've tried in the past. There's ways that we're thinking about do, using in the future. Some are study design related uh, methods and approaches, and the others are actually uh, patient identification um, approaches. So um, one of several of the methods that we've used in the past are um, we've um, used tighter inclusion and exclusion criteria. And although this is, you know, you can design the perfect mousetrap, it doesn't necessarily mean it will be enrollable or that it's even um, uh, consistent with the general population. And, and one of the things that you, you would like to see is that is this is the results of this study um, transferable to uh, other studies uh, or or the the general population you know or is it so finite to a, just a small distinct population that it doesn't really uh, it isn't really relevant and then other things that we've done is that we've tried to control for the duration of the disease and in this case, you know, you might have patients that are newly diagnosed that may have a spontaneous remission in there. So you want them to have had the disease that you're treating or the symptoms of the disease that you're treating uh, for a while because you, you don't know if, if this is a stable condition or if it's something that they may, um, you know, may randomly uh, just have spontaneous remission. So uh, that's one side of the thing uh, is the coin. The other side of the coin is that if you include people that have been in for, have had the disease for a long, long duration, um, it, it may be that they're just, uh, they've been misdiagnosed or that they have, um, uh, they're just refractory to treatment. So this could have a, a negative effect on your study as well. So uh, most of the chronic pain studies that we, um, we do um, we have inclusion criteria about, you know, patients must have had the disease for a certain amount of time and that, you know, in some cases, um, uh, in particular, uh, chemotherapy-induced neuropathic pain, uh, if they've had it for longer than um, a certain period, that we exclude them from uh, including in the, uh, being included in the study as well. So, What's the, um, you know, what's the best primary endpoint? Is it worse pain or average pain? And I've, you know, personally, I've always used average pain uh, as the primary endpoint, and I think that that's consistent with the impact guidelines for chronic pain treatment. Um, so um, I would um, uh, encourage you to consider that. And then um, uh, we've done... Uh, there was a presentation at I, uh, ASP last year um, by Shannon Smith who looked at a meta-analysis across um, uh, many uh, neuropathic studies and it was shown to be uh, no difference between worse pain and average pain as the primary endpoint. So there was the answers to the questions. Um, okay, so other methods that we've um, we've used to uh, decrease the placebo response are um, we've assumed that increased duration of the study um, uh, would 
uh, minimize or limit the placebo effects, but in in fact, um, there's been a uh, there was a uh, an article by uh, Steve Casey and uh, Michael Robotham about this very thing, and it, and when they looked at it in many studies in neuropathic pain, um, that patients actually improved more as the duration of the study increased. So this is a fallacy. It's not something that will happen. Um, so just by extending it doesn't mean the placebo response will actually, you know, level out or go down at some point. They continue to get better as the study goes on. And then open-label titration randomized withdrawal design, that's, um, we've done, we've used that in many opioid studies, uh, but that's an enriched patient population that allows you to make sure that the, 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 the patient population that you're treating is actually could could or would respond to um, uh, pharmaceutical treatment, and then you can subscribe to uh, services such as um, verified clinical trials or uh, CTS database that can help prevent patients from participating in competing studies and potentially preventing confounding uh, data from being included in the study and falsely increasing the placebo response. We've seen this many times. We did an IBS study in our clinics in, in when we had clinics in uh, Austin, Texas, and there were four other sites in Austin, Texas that were also doing the same study in IBS. And it turns out we had two women in the study that had been enrolled in all of all five of the Austin sites uh, in an IBS study. So that was very uh, telling. They were willing to even go through colonoscopy to get included in the study. So that's what you call desperate for being in the study. But that will just totally trash your results because you're pretty sure that they're not taking their study medication or they're maybe taking one but not all of them. So um, that's a big problem. So you want to get those people out of your studies as early as you can. So uh, one thing Scott talked about earlier was the increased variability uh, associated with um, the, the number of sites. As the sites go up, the, the lower the effect size. And this is just a, a, from a publication uh, in neurology um, that is quite old, but it's very profound. And, and when you look at it, the, uh, as you increase the number of sites, the, the variability goes up. So I would suggest that you try to use as few sites as possible. Um, maybe spend a little more time uh, with enrollment and less uh, and then fewer sites. I think it will pay off in the long run for you. Um, the other thing was looking at placebo run-in. You know, we've done that. Everybody's done it that's done chronic pain studies. Uh, in these two meta-analysis that are listed here, these two references, uh, the results showed that there was no benefit to excluding placebo responders during the uh, placebo run-in period. So, uh, I think that that's a, uh, a good idea not to do that. Uh, I think it's a waste. But what you can do, and um, I think you should do, is um, you can do a, uh, a flare in an OA study uh, versus non-flare. Uh, in this, in this uh, situation, you can see that the, uh, the flare design had a much better effect size than the uh, no-flare design. Uh, there's fewer... Um, studies with a no-flare design, which is probably because of no-flare is not as good, but the effect size is between 0.4 and 0.5 for the no-flare, but it's clear up to uh, between 0.6 and 0.7 for the flare design. Um, and then um, the run-in period to assess variability. Now, I just talked about a placebo run-in period, and I didn't recommend that, so we need to uh, look at, um, uh, uh, but um, uh, Dr. Farrar, as, as I've noted here, had <clears throat> did a presentation at APS this year and showed that, um, that it makes sense to do uh, a run-in period to um, assess the patient's willingness to participate in the study and that um, to assess their variability uh, in their response during that run-in period. So if they're all over the map, they're going from a 2 to a 7 and then a 3 to a 8 or something like that, then there's a lot of variability and they're not great pain reporters and you probably don't want them in your study. So, and he's even gone to the extent of um, recommending that you consider uh, excluding 
uh, the top 25% of patients who demonstrated high variability during the run-in period. And then he's also uh, thinking that uh, training will help. Um, I think that he's correct with that, and I'll talk about that in just a second and show you some data about that. And then you can pre-qualify patients, and um, at Analgesic Solutions, uh, they pr provided me with this data about their focused analgesia selection test where they uh, exposed patients, uh, each patient, to seven different temperatures seven different times. So a total of 49 uh, uh, temperatures and um, uh, in, a, in a very random uh, method. And you can see on the left-hand side of this, there's patients that have a highly variable uh, pain response. Uh, and then you have patients on the right, a patient here on the right that had a very good and very clustered low variability response to their uh, pain scores, and those are the people that you want in your study. You can screen patients for their acceptability prior to uh, putting them in the study uh, with this method if you choose, um, especially if it's in a condition that's very dear to you. You want to get the best patients in the study that are um, good reporters. Um, a lot of this can be uh, managed um, in the next study uh, with patient and site training. Um, so um, in this case, we see uh, the results of a, of a study where there were 50 patients in um, the, uh, a trained group and 50 patients that were not trained. Um, and you can see the, the overall results of the study are in panel A. Um, you can see the results of the patients that were trained and how much better their pain reporting was. As you'll note, the, the actual um, uh, treatment arm results did not improve uh, dramatically um, with the training, but the placebo results were the ones that were most affected by the uh, by the uh, training, and then um, as well as uh, there's a much larger difference between active and placebo, so the effect size was improved. And uh, if you looked at the uh, the final panel, the um, the the untrained group, they had a really high variability and standard deviation of their pain, and their ch and their change, the the delta of change was even um, in the negative direction instead of a positive direction. So uh, this uh, it validates my assumption, and this is one of the reasons why we include training in every one of our studies uh, that um, that it can improve uh, your um, the difference between drug and placebo. So uh, I need to wrap this up pretty quick, and uh, the, but what I want to talk about is that um, the placebo response is real in both uh, psychological and physiological um, and, and ultimately a statistical way, and that it threatens the approval of legitimate medications. Uh, unfortunately, I'm sure some of you have experienced that in the past, and uh, we know there's many examples of failed drug studies that were a result of uh, a uh, high placebo response, uh, even though we know the drug that was tested was um, an analgesic. And then it appears to be getting worse over time, and Scott talked about it seems to be a U.S. phenomenon uh, uh, more than a, um, a global phenomenon, but uh, keep in mind that it's still there and it exists and we need to um, uh, try to do what we can to manage it. And then um, there, as I talked about, there's both uh, study design and patient selection approaches to mitigating the placebo response. I talked about some that we've done before, uh, some that may or may not have any effects, but uh, some recommended ones that I have are uh, site training and patient training uh, to uh, uh, keep the patients uh, accurately reporting their pain scores. Um, and the site training to make sure that they are not doing anything to bias the patient's uh, pain uh, reporting during the study. So with that, uh, i am finished my presentation. And Lisa, I, I think we have time for a question or two, right? Yes, we do. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, Scott, for your presentation. So it was extremely interesting. And you did receive a lot of questions. Audience, we're not going to be able to get to all those. So I'm just going to ask... Um, um, a question for Scott. Um, 
and and Mike maybe, but you were just talking about the training and everything so, um, at the site. So do you, can you track site performance in relation to placebo separation? I'll take that, yeah. Um, so yes, and and it's becoming more common. Uh, I, I know that a lot of sites um, have, have asked, and, and as a CRO, we often, um, you know, ask this of our sponsors to to sort of close that feedback loop, right, and to, to get feedback on how how sites have performed in relation to um in, to placebo separation, and and it's not always um, available to, to us or to the site certainly, but they, we have programs now where we're utilizing to sort of sit on top of the databases that we that the, that we collect information in, and we're able to now. Um, you know, kind of go back and, and look at, at sites and how they compare when, when we're collecting all the data and when we're running the data management um, and see how they compared. I, I think we have to be um, careful uh, when we're doing that because um, we, we can't just compare, you know, a site's, you know, performance against placebo um, on we have to we have to compare them within the study, not just overall, because there, there are plenty of drugs that may never separate from placebo, and, and we wouldn't want that to, to sort of count against their performance. And, um, you know, the trial design itself may work against um, whether the, the, the drug uh, is successful or not. So it's not just a, a, a site performance issue. Um, I think it, it does provide, though, the opportunity for, for sites that do a very good job at it um, to you know, use that in their own sort of uh, recruitment and marketing with with, uh, with CROs and, and and sponsors in terms of of, of uh, you know advertising that they're able to separate from placebo on on you know drug X Y or Z. So yes, we we are looking at that now. It's become more popular. Uh, we do uh, we are engaging sponsors more when we're not the ones running the data uh, for that feedback and. Um, and, and yeah, that's that's something that we're looking at Great. now very often. Thank you, excellent. And um, a question for uh, Mike: Could you use a no treatment arm in a phase three parallel design study? Well, um, I don't think so. Um, okay. I think that we've had situations where um, we've had. Uh, placebo plus a note or standard of care, if you want to call it that, um, but our active and standard of care. But um, it's, um, it's more of a research tool because it allows you to look at the placebo response um, uh, accurately um, in that situation, but uh, I wouldn't want to include it in a phase three study, I think that that would be uh, problematic and may confound your data. I think you want to, you might want to do that early on if you're um, in, as Scott uh, noted earlier, that in phase two you can do a lot of things that you don't do in phase three because you're still looking for your dose, you're not penalized for multiple comparisons and things like that. So it might be something that you would consider early on in um, to look at, to get a handle on what that placebo response is. Um, but um, it, um, it's not something that I would ever uh, advocate for inclusion in phase three. Excellent, well thank you. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participating in today's event. Uh, Premier, the speakers will get back to you with your answers um, separately. So, and I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Premier Research, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through March of next year, and you will receive an email from Applied Clinical Trials alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay, and we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. So we will see you next time. Thank you for attending. Bye-bye.